Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, Jim Bros, what's up? It's Big Paul. I'm here tonight. I'm going to do a live Q&A with uh, training and nutrition questions. So if you got all your training and nutrition questions, pop them in the messages. I figure I'll start off, talk a little bit about my contest prep uh, to get everybody warmed up. So if you have any questions about that, <clears throat> I was just going to go through my diet where I'm at right now with my diet. Um, and I'll show you guys where, where things are at right now. And um, I think Kurt might jump on here with me in a few minutes too. So we'll see what's going on with Kurt as well. So I'm going to have him come on. Um, but let me know if you guys have any, uh, have any questions about the, about stuff and I will get your questions and we'll, we'll talk about them. All right. So for contest prep, I'll show you where I'm at right now. Um, Justin last week last week my food was a lot lower and i lost like seven pounds last week it was crazy um i i get in this phase of my contest prep where i get towards the end and my metabolism just starts spinning up sometimes i've had a few clients that get like that so this is why you can't have a prescribed diet for everybody like i'll get people that reach out to me all the time that want me to write them up a diet for losing weight and it's really hard to do that because your metabolism is constantly changing and adapting. And people that have done contest prep with me will know that sometimes I'm making changes to the diet on a weekly basis or to cardio on a weekly basis. Sometimes we're pulling food down. Sometimes we're adding food back in um, because it's, it's a constantly in flux thing. And last week I had a huge weight drop. So Justin pushed my food back up. And right now what I'm doing, I'm training six days a week. And I'm doing... Uh, five medium days, one high day, and one low day. I do a carb cycling diet for those that don't know. And so right now, my and with Justin's diet, as you can see here, hopefully he doesn't mind me sharing this, but uh, with Justin's diets, we don't count trace macros. I do that with my clients too. I know it makes people's heads explode sometimes. But uh, I do not count things like, you know, the couple grams of protein that are going to be in the rice or uh, a couple grams of fat that are going to be in your chicken breast. And the reason I don't do that is because it's all relative and it's just a lot of extra work. It doesn't really add any benefit. I know it's, it makes people drives people mad because they want to calculate everything down to the last little gram. And I used to do that. And I found that it makes very little to no difference at all. So right now where I'm at on my low day, he has me running 360 grams of protein 60 grams of carbs, 60 grams of added fat. This is my day for burning fat. I really is what I consider it. I get up in the morning, I'll do fasted cardio. And then I have basically no carbs. That that 10 grams of added carbs is essentially vegetables or, or a little piece of fruit. I'll do something like an apple, a small apple, or I'll do some some vegetables. I'm not a big vegetable guy, I'll be honest with you. I do not like vegetables that much. Um, so, you know, so it's, it's essentially no carbs that day. It's, it's mostly fiber. 
So 360 grams of protein. What it ends up with with calories on here, it, this is not counting the trace macro, so keep that in mind. We have about 2,200 calories, base calories. If you really count out all the trace macros, it's probably about 2,500 calories. Medium days are my training days that are not a high day. I usually do my high day on leg day since it's my biggest energy expenditure day and you're going to feel <laughs> the shittiest if you don't have some extra carbs in there. But my medium days right now are 370 grams of protein. That extra 10 grams from the high day is just from the intro workout shake, from the aminos that are in the intro workout shape. And I'm doing 230 grams of carbs. And I remember when 230 grams of carbs used to feel like a lot to me. And now I am freaking starving on 230 grams of carbs. I'm going hypo. And that's what happens when you get more muscle on you. It just, you know, 230 grams used to seem like a lot. It is not for me anymore. And I have 41 grams of added fat on that day. So I have a total of about of about 2,900 calories. That's not counting direct stuff. So really, or re really, it's like probably like about 3,300 calories total on that day. Um, oh, I see Kurt here. He's going to come in as well. So my medium day works out to be about 3,300 calories right now. And that is a deficit for me. I, I really, I'll lose weight on anything less than 4,000 calories right now. 4,200, 4,300. I think that's sort of where my BMR is at at this point. What's up, Kurt? What's up? I figured before I take questions, I'd get people warmed up, and I was going through my, my current contest prep diet. And then I do my one high day a week right now on contest prep, which is 950 grams of carbs, 320 grams of protein. You might ask why the protein is lower on that day. It's because carbs are protein sparing. Uh, and honestly, it's more just for your gut. Protein is really hard to digest, slows down digestion. We're jamming in carbs. Our, our objective on the high carb day is to load glycogen and just have enough protein uh, to you know sustain what we need for pro protein turnover and muscle protein synthesis, et cetera, which, which 320 is more than adequate. It's probably overshooting it. You could probably go with less. Yeah. Sometimes with my clients, I'll even go as low as 0.75 uh, grams per pound of body weight on, on the high day sometimes just so they can get the extra carbs down. And zero grams of added fat. Now, keep in mind, there's going to be some trace fats in there, so it's probably more like five to eight grams of fat per meal, something like that. A lot of times what I'll do instead of the last meal is I'll do a cheat meal. This this day, I think this past weekend, I, I had a good one. I, I had a, a two double cheeseburgers from Five Guys and a large fry. Nice. <laughs> Myself. It's probably, probably a little overshot in my... My Justin gives me a 1500 calorie allotment for my cheat meal. It was probably more like 2500 calories, but I still lost weight. So, um, so that you know, and, and half those carbs on that high day can come from sugar. And people that's another thing that makes people's heads explode. Why, why is it coming from uh sugar? It, it, it's mainly just for the ease of getting the food down. It, if you're eating a thousand grams of carbs, that's going to be something like 20 cups of rice. Yeah, Cooked it's gross. Rice. Yeah, you can't I can attest to that. It's gross. <laughs> you can't eat that much rice. So I've tried fifteen cups. It's vomit city. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I, I ten is about my limit. So that that's what I'm ten, twelve, something like that. So I'll do what I'll do. People people see me post Captain Crunch. I, I'm not eating that all day long. I'll I'll do like one meal with something stupid like that, or maybe two meals. But the rest of the time, it's usually fruit juice, bananas. Um, uh, sometimes I'll do jam. Uh, apple pie filling those are the things that i'll do the apple pie, pie filling i get has dextrose in it um, or i'll find some candy that has dextrose in it gummy bears have dextrose in it there there are certain candies that i get these uh, sorbets that are made it's talente they they use uh, uh, dextrose which is funny i I've, I've never seen that in a sorbet before but they use dextrose probably for a texture thing i don't know um, but anyway, that's what I do. So let's uh, it, let's grab some questions here. And and Marty says apple pie filling is the bomb. <laughs> I, I I do love me some apple pie filling. I get the uh, Harris Teeter stuff. There used to be, I think Chad Nichols was the guy that started the apple pie filling thing, if I remember yep, correctly. I agree. Um, and I think he found an apple pie filling that had dextrose in it. Is what it was. But I think it was Chad Nichols that started that. I, I I can tell what 
what phase of the diet I'm on by the shit that I add to my diet. I'm, I don't know if you can see, but I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the crystal light lemonade phase of my diet now. <laughs> I, I usually start off with pickles and then I progress to sauerkraut shit that keeps me full without uh, adding any calories. All right. So let's back up. Let's see some, let's see some questions here. Let's see here. Matt, Michael Mass, I can't seem to get over 305 on bench no matter what I do. Light a fire under my ass, please. Uh, I'm not a big, I used to be a really good bench presser. And I don't do them anymore. I think I upset a lot of people <laughs> when I put that video out about bench pressing sucking for bodybuilding. I, I don't think it's a great movement for bodybuilding. But I get that, you know, for powerlifting, it's, um, or strength sports, it's something that's necessary. And I used to love bench presses. I, I got strong as fuck on bench presses. Usually guys with long arms aren't good at bench presses. But for some reason, I don't know if it's just the unique way that my tendons attach or something, but I've always been strong on bench press. But I remember my first two years of lifting, my goal was to get to 225, and I could not crack 225. I said I was not going to talk about PEDs tonight, but I, I remember I took Anadrol, and within a week I was benching 225 for like eight reps. I went from zero to eight reps in a week. I believe it. <laughs> Uh, so, so Michael just takes a manager draw. <laughs> <laughs> no, I re really bench press seems to correspond with, with body mass. It, it's yeah. the bigger you get, the stronger your bench press is going to be. It's really that, that simple. There is some neurological drive to, to it. it you know, I, I've seen some guys that are strong in bench press that aren't that big. Um, so, you know, I don't know. What, what do you think, Kurt? I mean, I, I would say if you if you know any, I don't, I'm guessing you're a bodybuilder if you're following this. I was going to say what I'm with Paul on the the benching now. I think as we get older, like my body just doesn't agree with it anymore. But when I got my bench up, I had powerlifters watch me bench and tweak my technique. I never arched my back, but they were showing me other ways, things I was fucking up. I think that bench press is actually a really technical lift. It's very and technical. I, think I wasn't doing it correctly. Um. But yeah, I mean, I've I've gotten injuries from benching, so I don't really bench much anymore. Well, um, what I found when my bench exploded is when I used to bench with a wide grip is when I started keeping my elbows. And you'll notice, not that I'm an, a powerlifting expert by any means, but you'll notice that uh, powerlifters, for the most part, at least the men, keep their elbows tucked in yep. so they get more dry from the tricep and from the lats, front delts. And that's why bench presses aren't that great of a, Pack no. builder. <laughs> my dad was a power lifter when I was younger, and something he also had me do was bench with three different grips until they were all equal. So I had no weak spots. So he would have me narrow, wide, and you know, medium, and until I could do them all at the same weight. So then you knew that there was no like structural weakness there, at least. Yeah, I'm just you know, so if you're a bodybuilder, I would now. say I ice think machine press or machine press now. Yeah, I don't even I don't even Smith machine presses uh, hurt hurt my shoulders. I, I think they're I mean they're less risky than than bench presses, but I've just seen so many people tear packs. Yeah, on. It's I still no dumbbell exact. press sometimes. Yeah, I'll dumbbell press here and there. Well, I was until I tore my labrum this past oh. year. I really liked on dumbbell press. Ironically, I tore my freaking labrum on on pull ups of all things. And then, and then I re-aggravated, and I think I tore it worse doing incline bench presses. So I was just like, man, I got to stop doing this. Um, uh, let's see here. What do we have? This is a good one. Keith, do you have a specific pre-bed meal you eat that's more satiating? I don't know what strategies you have, Kurt, but I tend to stack my carbs up at the end of the day. I, I there's this I dog, there's this dogma out there that. You not you're not supposed to eat carbs before bed. I don't know where that came from. Um, when when you have insulin present, you're going to sleep better. Yeah, when you, your insulin naturally goes up after you fall asleep anyway. Yeah, so I in you don't I I used to have when I was younger I used to have a hard hard time with controlling the urge to binge at night because I would restrict my food. I would not eat carbs like after five o'clock. There was this there was a trainer I worked with. The sun goes down right. Yeah, there was a trainer I used to work with that told me you shouldn't have carbs after after like three three p.m. And Dante used to preach that too, right? Yeah, yeah, that was one of one of Dante's things. And 
I actually found it was had the opposite effect on me. It made me have these crazy nighttime cravings, and I'd find myself face first in a bucket of Ben and Jerry's at 1 a.m. And it was just like not productive. And then, then I started doing a, I don't know if you ever messed around with carb backloading diets. Mm -hmm. I started doing a carb backloading diet and it was, I think Todd got me on that. And that was the best luck I ever had with the diet. But if you're on a low carb phase, like say contest prep right now, I will eat stuff that's higher food volume. So at night, a lot of times what I'll do, omelets are a huge food volume. I'll make an omelet before bed or I'll have a uh, lean steak or something like that before bed with some vegetables. So, so I think food volume helps. But if you're in an off season phase, I, the best thing I found is just eating some carbs before yeah, bed. I do the same as Paul for, I think when I'm in contest prep, I do some sort of meat before bed, maybe some carbs, depending on what my macros are. I right now, because I'm not concerned with it, I do like two cups oatmeal and then some eggs. Yeah, and that would be before something bed. slow. And I do it like immediately before bed. That would be something slow digesting yeah. and keep you I, Otherwise, I'm starving when I wake up. Yeah. Um, um, let, me, let me see here. Do you have something else to add to that? No, I was just going to say, because it's only a natural, um, it's probably going to come up at some point. I, I feel like then guys are going to be like, well, when do you use your growth hormone? It doesn't matter if you eat or not when you inject growth hormone. There's nowhere in the instructions on Saracen that says take on an empty stomach. I think guys get way obsessed when they take their growth. Yeah, so with food, I, mean, I, I take. I literally will eat and take it, or take it and eat. It does not make a difference. No. And when is your stomach ever empty when you're it's a bodybuilder? Never. No, it's never. <laughs> right. No. I've heard. I've heard of these coaches say take a half hour after you eat, and I'm like, what difference? Why? Does that it make? takes three hours to absorb. Yeah, I know. It's 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 stupid. It makes zero sense. Um. All right. Uh. Black Kaiser. If you're in a calorie deficit to lose weight or make weight, does it include lean meats like fish and chicken breast? Yeah. Course. I think our bulking diet does too. Yeah, I think he's talking about uh, maybe having a weight cut for a uh, weight for like a, a show or maybe for a bodybuilding. Well, he, I see he's got a picture of being a bodybuilder, like maybe if he's cutting into classic. Usually if I have somebody I need to squeeze into a weight class at the end, I'll cut carbs and I'll pull the water way back. I know it freaking sucks. But, you know, 16, you know, a, a gallon of water is eight what eight eight and a couple pounds. pounds yeah right so it's huge yeah i mean you can you can pull eight pounds off of you in a day yeah i did it once i did seven once in a day where i just did chicken and asparagus for a day i was 189 i needed to weigh 182 i made it in a day you're gonna be flat like, as a pancake i felt like garbage but i made weight yeah i mean anybody who wrestled i wrestled for a few years uh knows about making weight spitting in a cup and sitting in the sauna i just had a client last weekend that was having he was three pounds over the cutoff for his classic uh, cutoff, and I had him go sit in the sauna, and we cut his water down eight ounces a meal on on the day of the of the weigh in, and we we got him in no problem. <clears throat> we got him down like four or five pounds. Um, let's see, but I, I left the proteins in because proteins aren't going to promote water retention; carbs will. No, and actually they have a diuretic effect, so they actually yeah. help get rid of some. Uh, let me see here. Robert. Robert Forenbach. I don't know if I said that right, Robert. Sorry. Uh, oh, yes, people eat lean. Okay, so. Uh, and keep fats from sources like, uh, like avocado, olive oil, mac nut, oil, butter, etc. Yeah, I think he's just contributing to that conversation. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I'll have people do their added fats. Uh, da, 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 da. let's see here, Paul. Any ideas to maximize pumps and lifts for training first thing in the morning? This drives me nuts. I was just arguing with one of my clients about it, and he was insisting on training fasted. <laughs> and that is the big thing I see with dudes that train in the morning, they want to train fasted. <laughs> You're dehydrated, you don't have any carbs in you, there's no, no salt, no salt nothing. You're not going to get a pump. No, it, it, it's just, it is that simple. And, and if you're trying to promote anabolism, why would you not have carbohydrates, amino acids, salt, water present? You're not going to grow if you don't have any of those things present. Yeah, the I mean, fasting thing never made sense to me, right? I think as bodybuilders, we spend so much effort trying to eat often throughout the day, and then we go and do something like super catabolic, like lift. 
without right. feet. That makes really no sense. It, it makes absolute zero sense. So I think that's the problem with guys that lift first thing in the morning. I would make sure that you're fully hydrated. I would make sure that you've had s- some a meal with some salt, probably carbs and protein. If you have a hard time getting the food in when you first get up, I, I had a guy tell me that he didn't have time to eat. And I'm like, dude, get up 15 minutes earlier. I wake up. So I wake up at four 30 in the morning. So I eat, I'm lifting by six, six 30. I'm probably passing you in the night, Kurt. I'm like, yeah. just going to bed. A couple hours <laughs> but I'm t- like I, my wife thinks I'm nuts, but I wake up on purpose just to eat breakfast. There's no way I'm hitting my macros if I'm not waking up to do that. Yeah. I mean, you have to. Yeah. In the off season, like if I, if I, if I sleep in, I, I'm screwed, man. Yeah. I, I can't do it either. I can't get all my meals in. So, I mean, if you're really crunched for time in the morning, you can't get your ass out of bed 15 minutes earlier. I mean, it it is not that hard to make a protein shake, throw a little bit of sea salt in it, and eat orange juice too. Yeah, orange juice. That's what I. If you take, that's what I do. I take orange juice with uh, vanilla protein powder, and it tastes like a sort. It tastes like uh, the orange sherbet. Yeah. (laughs) And then I'll 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 throw some salt when you're lifting too. Yeah, I'll I'll throw some salt in with it, and I'll uh, jam a couple bananas or something. And that 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 should be enough to get you through, and then do an intro workout shake. But I I don't this this concept of training fast it just drives me insane. Um. Anyway, uh, that was a side rant. I don't know if you really meant that you're training. <laughs> I would say water, salt, carbs. Right. I mean, what water, salt, salt, carbs, muscle, amino acids. Salt drives the carbs in there, right? Glucose yep. working on a sodium potassium pump, and water. I try to drink at least a liter in the morning. I was talking to a guy at the gym today. He was telling me that his coach pulled all of his salt out on peak week. And I was just sitting there thinking. <laughs> I mean, go back. If you listen to interviews with Samir Banu, one of the reasons why he struggled placing in the Olympia for years is because he used to pull the salt. That was like a thing they did in the seventies and they would flatten out and then smooth out. Well, no shit. You can't load. Yeah, <laughs> I, can I know, but, but they didn't know, but this is stuff we know now. They didn't know back then. And where does all of that where does all that water go if you don't have any salt yeah, to pull it into exactly. the cell? It's under it's your skin. Under your skin. Intracellular, right? Yep. Uh all right. Uh let's see here. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. What do we got? Uh, somebody was saying eat rice cakes, these little mini rice cakes. Yeah, those things pound a punch, man. If you there, you can get those down quick. Um Let's see. This what is this guy? I started training and gained thirty five pounds in six months. I hope this is normal. I mean, it could happen. You could. It's probably water mostly. Well, it's, it's not. It's associated tissue, right? It's not all tissue like lean right. body mass per se. There's blood volume that goes up. There's glycogen, water, some fat. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've had. I've had. It seems like my growth when when I've had it in the past always happens in these huge spurts and then I stagnate for a while. It's really weird. Like, I don't think my stage weight this year is going to be much different than it was last year, maybe a couple pounds, but I look way denser than I did last year. And that's why weight's deceiving, right? Yeah. So I don't get too focused on weight. I get guys that that I train, that get obsessed on the scale moving and I'm like, I'm not that worried about it. Just look, look at your best. You look your best you can. Look at your pictures. Usually people that are scale chasers that worry about their weight on the scale end up just getting fat. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I've found. Uh, and vice versa. If you're on prep, like I get some guys that are worried about, well, usually it's women, but um, that are worried about the scale moving down. Um, and that's also not great either. I look at, I look at body composition. The way I do check-ins, I'll have people send side front and rear relaxed picks every week and i keep the original ones that we started off with and i look back at those and see what has changed since we started and i'll also look from week to week and see if i see changes week to week sometimes it's harder sometimes i'll go back like uh three or four weeks and see what changes i see now you get towards the end of contest prep oh the last, it's, it's day to day yeah, it's day to day yeah things start changing rapidly so I don't get too focused on the scale. I, I really let, and this is why if you're, if you're training yourself and you're not working with a trainer, I would take progress picks weekly, keep them consistent. Don't 
for you know don't 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 worry about making them look I see, I see these bros at the gym in the posing room they're turning the lights down and using all the filters and stuff that's not telling you the truth you know take the shittiest pictures you possibly can keep the light as consistent as you can do it in the same place same time of the day in the same room at the same positions and then you can evaluate your physique growth i have decades of progress picks i have progress picks all the way back to shit 2000 2001 yeah i, remember I, I might have, my first i think i have some from the 90s that i took pictures of film I'll pictures have to, i'll have to post some sometime some of the pictures on my website are from like the 90s that i have my some wife funny ones stand in. i have some funny ones but it's uh <laughs> i'll have to see if i can find them uh let's see here what do we got here? I noticed that myself as a natural athlete, I sometimes have a drop, have to drop carbohydrates more and more and up the fats as I get deeper into the diet to feel better. Is that what you guys typically see as well? Yeah, probably. Yeah, because your hormones are crashing. Yeah, it's when you're an enhanced athlete, the the fats are probably less important. Yeah. The only, I just, my joints start to hurt out while they get too low, but. Yeah, I mean, if you did labs, if you were super lean and natural, and you did labs, your your testosterone stuff's pretty low, probably at that point. Yeah, so that that's not out of the ordinary. It it's it's wild. I don't know if you've been to any natural shows. I've prepped a couple natural guys. Mm-hmm. The natural guys get shredded. Yeah, like they get more shredded than a the, lot of the enhanced guys do. A lot of right. guys use drugs as a crutch, and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, so clearly you don't need drugs to get shredded. So no. it's impressive how lean some of these guys. Now they they're not carrying the same sort of mass oh. and fullness that the no, no, but they the conditioning is still there. Uh, probably better in a lot of cases. Here, Paul, I'll send you you could because you could put a picture up, right? I don't have the ability. Um, yeah, it depends on where you send it. Where do you want me to send it? Uh, maybe Instagram or to my email. Okay, I'll send you a picture. I was na- oh, you've seen it before. I'll send him a picture of my back when I was natural. I mean, I think I was a whopping 150 pounds here. I guess if I'm probably leaner than most guys on drugs here, I'll find it. We can keep going. I was, uh, I was more of the, I was the perma balker in my 20s, man. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty embarrassed about. It. I, I remember looking back on those pictures and thinking to myself, "God damn, I looked." I thought I looked big, and I look back at it, and I'm like, "Oh my god, what was I doing?" So, folks, when you hear me preaching about don't be a perma balker, I speak from experience. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, man, I was such a fat ass. Um, I'm going to see if I can find these pictures I had. But, yeah, it it was – I had some – Where do you want me to send this to Instagram? Um, Email? Yeah, you can send it to Instagram or email. Either one is fine. The Big Paul one? Yeah, that's fine. But yeah, I, I kept, uh, I have photos all the way back to the early 2000s when I first got a digital camera. Yeah, this is going to this is gonna make you laugh. Hang on, I'm going to share this one. This is from 2003. I had hair. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this this was this was three hundred pounds, fat and happy. <laughs> <laughs> that was my. That, that was three hundred pounds there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was about three hundred pounds. That's my D ball and testosterone days. <laughs> yeah, it's like Dorian in the off season. You get suppose. <laughs> oh man, I remember looking at this. And I'm like, damn, I'm on my way. <laughs> I'm gonna be a pro next year. To answer this guy's question, too, I when. Paul gets a picture. I ate more fat when I was natural too. I ate more like salmon and stuff like that. It was the only way I could feel good. I could tolerate super low carbs, but I needed to have some fat in there. And it's the opposite now. I can pretty much run on like no fat, except fish oil. Here's the picture of Kurt. Yeah, you were super lean here, man. So this is natural. I yeah, actually enjoy suffering. I don't mind being hungry. I, I, you know what's funny now that I've been dieting for a long time, kind of feels good. Yeah, I enjoy. I actually get sick of the off season, man. I was ready to be done with it this year. I'm just like I'm done. I feel bloated. I feel fat. I don't. I'm tired of eating. I don't have any appetite. 
I wasn't getting all my food down. Justin's like, man, are you getting your food down? I'm like, dude, I, I just can't. I, acid reflux, just blah. And, you know, walking upstairs, getting out of breath, my freaking ankle swelling up. It's just, uh, it's not, it's not fun. Although now, now I want, <laughs> now I want some food. <laughs> now you want a cheeseburger. Uh, let's see here. Griffin, can you explain intro workout nutrition and why it's so important, how it works? I'll hand this one off to you, man. Okay. So the human body runs on glucose. This is its primary source of energy pretty much all the time. I mean, during sleep, your body might use slightly more fat than glucose. Um, but lifting is an anaerobic workout and anaerobic workouts require glucose. Like you can't really tap into fat when you're lifting weights. Um, the body can't really cleave off the, so triglycerides can't really turn into glucose. The, the glycerol backbone can, but that's a long process. So your body, if it doesn't have glucose while you're lifting, it's going to make glucose by destroying your muscles. So while you're lifting, you're actually causing damage to them if you don't fuel yourself during it. Guys in the 70s like Arnold and stuff didn't have to because of the drugs. So like an enhanced athlete doesn't have to, but why would you leave those gains on the table? That's why I look at it. Right. And then it kind of primes your body. So then your post-workout meal, you're, you're already primed. You're already got, you know, your insulin's high. Everything's ready to go. That's the way I look at it is you're, yeah. you're kind of leaving the drinking water is great and all, but you're leaving a lot of shit on the table by not, you know, I have electrolytes, carbs and amino and essential amino acids in mine. I know. Um, what's his name? Milo Sarchev. That's his whole thing. The like he, calls it, he calls it his hyperemia yep. program or whatever, where he put, I mean, he'll, I've seen him do like was 200 grams of dextrose and intra workout shakes, yeah. something like that. Well, it makes, I mean, from like a, from like a physiology point of view, when you're at rest, like for you and I right now sitting down, most of your blood circulation is in your core, right? Yep. And that's when you lift, it goes to your peripheral, you know, your limbs. When same as if you took oral steroids under your tongue, a lot of guys don't understand this. They'll be like, oh, I'm going to take Anadrol and put it under my tongue, but I'm sitting on a couch. It's going to go right to your liver anyway, because that's where the circulation is. If you take it right before you lift, then it'll actually go to where you want to go with bypassing your liver. Same thing as you know, this whole process with carbs. It's like, why, you know, they, what, what Milos was saying is basically you have the circulation in the muscles at that point. You want to, yeah, why, nutrients yeah, why not take, muscles. why not drive it to the muscles? And that's sort of where insulin plays into the yeah. whole thing. Um, you know, not that I'm... I don't know if you want to, Todd and I were going to do like a five part series on insulin, like all the functions of insulin. Yeah. If you want to jump on that? It'll be, we're, we're going to go back and forth on different channels. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be fun. Uh, let's see what we got here. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Let's see. On a high day. Let's see here. On a high day, do you use a long acting nu nutrient transporter once? Or I think he's talking about uh, mm -hmm. insulin, the insulin use on the high day. All right. Yeah, I'll address that. So I run on my high day. I'll, I do both. I'll run Lantus in, in the morning. I'll do just whatever the dosing schedule is on their site uh, for a base baseline, basal insulin. To it, people, I don't think people understand the difference between basal and uh, rapid acting insulin. Uh, you're with the basal insulin. Your body has a. And you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Kurt. But you you have a baseline of insulin that's present at all yeah, times. It's like a background. It's like yeah, background and, noise. It's there constantly. And something like Lantus or Novolin N is designed to replace that. Yeah. It's not for power shoving a meal down. It's not right. going to help with that. Yeah. It's really just taking pressure off of that's your right. beta cells yep. in the pancreas, giving your pancreas a break. So when you see guys eating thousand plus grams of carbs a day it's really hard to do that without insulin present yep so that that's to, to alleviate pressure off that and then i will use a rapid insulin i personally i run it every other meal you you could probably do it every meal if you had something faster but a human human log even at three i i've i've tested it on my own blood sugar meter and just, or I've, I've used a continuous glucose monitor. It is still present, even though it says it mostly oh, yeah. clears at three hours, it is still present at probably five hours. Yeah. You uh, you can, if you're using it frequently. 
Computer. Yeah, there's a calculator you can grab online that will show you how much you need for based on the amount of carbs you you eat. So it's less. So the safe bet would be to take it every other meal. That's what I do. And I usually run one unit per 20 grams of carbs somewhere around there. That's a pretty That's safe, right. pretty safe, pretty safe number. I, people all the time talk about the one per 10 and that the, that's for people that are diabetics, right? You know, if, if you have impaired glucose sensitivity, you really just have to sort of monitor your blood glucose levels and see how you respond. Uh, there, there is really no, people want a formula for using insulin and there really is no formula for it. You just have to adjust based on what your glucose levels are. You know, that's why it's important to monitor your glucose levels. Yeah. And that's I've noticed like, as I progress in contest prep, even on my high days, sometimes as little as three units will make me go hypo. Yeah, this is why I don't. Guys will ask me a lot on Instagram to to talk about insulin and dosing and stuff, and I avoid it because it's not it's an individual thing. Yeah. And unless I'm coaching someone, I'm really hesitant to tell someone how to use insulin. Right, but like I will hear the same. I, there's general guidelines, but I I personally would I stay away from people I don't know. Yeah, it's them. it's dangerous if you fuck it up. I just don't want to fuck someone up and tell them the wrong amount. Right. I don't know. Yeah, from but I, I will say this, you know, speaking in generalities, you will see guys that are running super high carb diets. They're running insulin. They, they almost have to be. Yeah. Mo I mean, mo in most instances. Yeah. Um, let me see here. Da, da, da. What do we got on here? Oh man, I really hate this term. It's a po I hate the term lean bulk. <laughs> um, it's sort of like uh, being fat cut. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess you could stay leaner while, while you bulk. I mean, it's just, some is genetics. Like my body fat never really goes out of the single digits, no matter what I do. But th I'm not trying to do that. I mean, Paul can attest to that. I eat, I shovel whatever will fit my body. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Brian. I don't. I mean, if you're if you're a runner, it's he says he's a runner and he wants to know if he can bulk up to 195, stay lean, while still hitting five minute averages. I would think adding body weight is counterproductive for being a runner. So I was, I ran Division One track. I started as a miler, and then they moved me to the hundred meter, and I gained weight for that, and I can no longer run a competitive mile. And now that I'm 215, I can't run a competitive hundred either. I could probably run a competitive 40. So every 10 pounds you put on is going to destroy your time. Yeah. I don't even, even know if I could run a mile now. And I was a world-class miler. I couldn't even run a mile. Even if it's muscle, you, you probably. No. Well, you, cardiac stroke is still the same. doesn't matter if it's fatter. Yeah. It has the output, you know. I used to play basketball. Um, I was, you know, a competitive basketball player. And, and it's definitely size is not great for playing basketball. You want to be lean, light on your feet. You want to be able to jump. Anything, Anything where you're endurance cyclists they try to get as light as they possibly can be so i you know here's what i would say and this is what i tell people all the time is specialize your training for your sport if you want to be the best at it if you don't care about being the best if you're just you know like i i really had to come to the conclusion that if i wanted to be a competitive bodybuilder i had to give up jujitsu and i had to give up playing recreational basketball I just was, you know, I'm spinning my wheels otherwise. Uh, I, I love both of them. I did jujitsu for years. I played recreational bas basketball for years. But I can't do that and be a 280-pound bodybuilder. It just doesn't work. No. So if I were going to be a competitive basketball player, I would specialize my training for a basketball, for a basketball. If I were going to be a competitive jujitsu guy, I would specialize my training for jujitsu. So I, I would say that you're probably, you're trying to row upstream. It's probably not the best use of effort. If you really want to put on size, then I would say, give up that five minute. mile. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. What's this say? James Smith. I got to 9% body fat at 257 pounds. That's, big at 64 would it be reasonable to assume i should be able to get down below 240 with a longer cut and water manipulation to make weight for the cutoff uh for classic physique i don't know what it is at 64 now it's pretty high yeah i don't know if you need to be 240 
Um, let me look it up. They they just cranked it up. Like I was I was like for me, they just moved it. It used to be two twenty four. I think they moved up to two thirty two for me. And I'm like, damn, I might be able to get down to two thirty two. Um, let me see what it is. No, it is tempting to go into classic, but I don't know. I just I like bodybuilding. Two fifty seven. He, he said he's six four. Yeah, I mean, if you got to fi- give or take, I mean, it's assuming it's it's. There's never a straight calculation, but it's like if you got to five percent body fat, he would be roughly two forty five. Well, with a little bit of water off. It yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, like pure weight loss, you could get leaner than that in theory, depending on the person. All right, so yeah, at six four. It is two forty six. Okay, so, so yeah, know, I mean, it, if you got to five percent, you'd be right there without water. Yeah, two forty six is really doable. So, I would, I would, yeah, you know, two forty six. The new cutoffs are are nice. I think they were too low before because guys were doing crazy shit. They were too low. Um, they they were doing tra- crazy shit to squeeze in. Uh, like, like I said, I had a guy sitting in the sauna. And, and doing stuff like that. That's not exactly good for you the day before a bodybuilding show. No. Uh, let me see here. That's funny. Paul's working his ass off every day. I feel like every time I pop on the YouTube, he's got new content. I've been slacking lately. I think I only had two videos last week. Um, and I did the one with Kurt. I like making videos. I have yeah. fun doing it. I have one and uploading that- right now as we speak my channel i've gotten it down to a science now it doesn't take me too long uh, as you know kurt i'm an epic talker so i just get in front of the camera <laughs> well, i told you i tried to do one after the one we did i tried to film one on my own and i realized i couldn't talk for more than five minutes alone i tried and tried and tried. <laughs> i could not do it i tried to talk slower i couldn't do it so I, my, it, I had todd on todd will make me talk for two hours oh todd todd can talk <laughs> <laughs> so there's one with Todd going up right now. It's not, it's Todd can definitely talk. My my girlfriend, she's a, she was telling me that I'm an epic talker, and and she'll just sort of tune me out after a while. She's not like mean or anything. She just <laughs> zones out because I'll start rambling on about something r- random, and then she uh, it, it, I told her that hey my my random conversations are paying off now with YouTube. Yeah, they definitely are. The whopping six hundred dollars a month I make from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> People think I'm a YouTube millionaire. I, this is a labor of love. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Good thing I got IT to back me up. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, this is funny. Uh, Robert says, I think the dogma about the pre-bag carbs is so normal. People don't eat a ton of ice cream. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 true. It's it, These are, I forget, they make these rules for fat people. Yeah. It's pretty hard. Kurt and I were talking about it earlier. It's pretty hard getting fat eating fish and rice and chicken yeah, and rice. I don't think you can. You you look at everybody. I mean, Japan. We we were talking about yeah. the Blue Zone diet earlier. That documentary on on uh, Netflix. But they were yeah. talking about the people that live the longest in the world, and they all eat rice and fish. Yeah. It's, <laughs> and yeah. they're all it's a hard carb diet, low fat diet. Yeah, they're yeah. It's pretty much yeah. I mean, it's EFAs. Yeah. Rice. Yeah, like it was like sweet potatoes and fish. Sweet potatoes and fish, rice, uh, legumes, EF, a lot of EFAs, nuts, yeah. shit like that. Not the American diet, full no. of saturated. Well, no. And Paul, Paul will probably attest to this as well. Any clients that I have that really struggle losing weight, when you actually get them to tell you the truth, they're not eating what you're supposed to be eating. No. They're, they're cheating on their diet because if they actually stuck to their macros, there's no way they'd be fat. Uh, this is this is this is one we just talked about earlier. If you're doing a lean bulk, how many calories over your basal metabolic rate should you suggest? I'm doing really well, 250 calories. The the BMR man th- that drives me nuts because it it's so it changes daily. You don't know what your BMR really is. Uh, it's your activity level, your hormones, your just drugs that you're taking. Everything affects itself. The stomach effect of food. The thermic effect, yeah, exactly. The thermic effect of food. I'll actually see in it in it when I first started doing it, it didn't make any sense to me. Like I'll pull people out of out of a diet phase, and I'll start adding carbs back in, and they they Good lose leader. even more weight. So the upregulation, I guess, from from thyroid and everything from yeah, the carb, yeah, everything. So I, you know, as a as a coach, 
I use the, that, that is one place where scale is a useful tool. The combination of the scales and the scale and the pitchers. I will keep adjusting food until I see a weight gain without any, uh, in the off season. What I'll do is I'll just keep slowly um, pushing up the carbs. I'll make small, small pushes, you know, like 30, 40 grams a day until the scale starts moving and I don't see a decline in body composition. And if I start to see a decline in body composition, then I'll pull things back. But generally when I see people have a decline in body composition in the off season, it's because they're eating too much junk. They're getting too much saturated fat and, and, and yeah, trash food. Junk. And, it comes in a box in a package. Yeah. It's, it's usually that. And I would say 250 calories over your BMR in the off season for me, I would just, I try to keep pushing the food up as high as I possibly can go and get their metabolisms as high as I possibly can get them. I don't, I don't say I'm only going to be 250 calories over. If I get somebody up to eating 7,000 calories and they're not getting fat, you know how easy dieting down and getting guts going to be? But that's where you are with me. Yeah. I'm not going to have to diet. I mean, you, you pull down to 5,000 calories, man. You're going to be losing two, three pounds a week. Yeah. Well, I did just to see, I went, um, I go to a lifetime gym on yep. occasion and they have metabolic testing. So I had them do, I had them hook me up to this machine. I sat still for an hour. I couldn't have coffee. I couldn't have food. couldn't have anything. And I was, according to their stupid machine, I burned 5,200 calories sitting still. <laughs> they thought the machine was broken. <laughs> they tested so they tested my body fat too again it's not accurate at all but it came back at three percent again yeah um, well it's not that you'd be dead if it was three percent i had like 180 pounds of lean body mass which again is not accurate i don't know what's wrong with those machines but yeah i mean you want to be as heavy as possible as so you burn as many calories as possible um this is a good question sounds great sun crave sons crave i always get this wrong to do with the band uh, do you guys see fasting okay for cutting if you're trying to preserve muscle? I feel like fasting makes my total. I mean, not eating is not good for preserving muscle. I mean, you're going to be catabolic. Your, your body's going to start breaking down proteins for carbohydrates. Yeah. There's genes that are expressed too when you don't eat um, forkhead box, all sorts of wasting genes. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of fasting. The only time I will fast uh and this, I have done it in the past, Kurt, is I have had my off and on battles with all sort of colitis. Yeah, well, that's kind of forced, right? Yeah, and I sometimes, if my gut is really fucked up, if, if I do like a, a, a full day fast or a 12-hour fast, you know, probably, you know, I would do, usually what I would do is I would not eat from the time I go to bed until maybe like 8 p.m. the night the next night, and that would give my stomach a break and and make my stomach feel better. A lot of the problems I would have would go away. Yeah. But for p- growing, for preserving muscle, not eating is not no, good. By definition, it's catabolic. And catabolic. If, if you're if you're with the colitis, you're not absorbing anything anyway. So at that point, any food you're eating is not getting absorbed. So right. eating wasn't doing any good anyway. Yeah, when you're just diarrheing it all. I mean, the definition, when people talk about absorption, they're like, well, can you absorb this amount of protein? Can you absorb? The definition of absorption is it's not coming out as diarrhea long story short, like <laughs> right. if it's coming out as liquid, you're not absorbing it. So if anything that's coming out solid means you're absorbing your food, most fecal uh, matter is not, it sounds gross, but most of what comes out as a waste is dead cells and stuff. It's not like, it's not like you ate a burrito and it comes out as a burrito. Your body absorbs the majority of the food you eat outside of fiber. You know, what's hilarious, dude, uh, uh, we're talking about poop, the deeper you get in the contest, oh, prep, like a rabbit. I, yeah, like I have not. There's like nothing left. Yeah, or little <laughs> droplets, like a deer. I have to. I have to get a fiber supplement yeah. just to just to keep things moving. Yeah, well, I tell again, it's gross, but I've clients. You get deep into a cut, and you talk about that kind of stuff, right? I'm like, what does your shit look like? Is it if it looks like a banana, you're still eating too much food? It shouldn't look like that anymore. Um, let's see. Brian's stuck on this on this five minute mile at. at, at at 195, he paid for this, so I I am going to okay talk about a, a cycle M, MK677 or CJC. I I don't know. So MK677, I think, has some validity. It's on its way to becoming a prescription drug. It was just yeah. bought by a small startup company. I, my I have some clinical experience with MK. I think it has validity for children, and I think it has validity for older people. 
think if you're a young, healthy person, I, I've, I used it. All it did is make my appetite go up and I had weird dreams. It doesn't compare to human growth hormone at no. all functionally. No. I mean, and I can say that having used both, it is not anywhere near the same. My father's in his seventies and he has arthritic knuckles and it helped that go away. But outside of something like that, it's, I don't know. And I think the other peptides, I don't know. I, I don't think you're going to get much of a performance enhancing effect out of it. No. I mean, you'd be better off with something that's going to protect nitrogen, right? Primabolin, Anavol. Right. I mean, if you're worried about mild, a little bit of test, a little bit of a DHT. Well, I know like with uh, endurance athletes, they're all from, at least from what I've seen, like cyclists and um, cyclists and sprinters and people like that. It seems they all love uh, uh, equipoise for the red blood cell production. That's what yeah. I. That's what I've seen. I was going to say you could use EQ because I can definitely. I definitely have more endurance on it, but I don't know if I don't. I think EQ can can be considered mild. I don't know if I always consider it that way. Probably depends on the dose. Yeah. Um, well, Brian, you're if you're you're intent on running that five minute mile at, at 195 pounds. <laughs> I mean, then if I'm, you could I'm, do it, the more, more kudos to you, man. I mean, I would say then use. Like I said, want to use like a TRT or slightly like an athletic TRT dose and I don't know, 50 milligrams of anabol. You, oh God. What was the name of that document? Icarus, the documentary about the, yeah. the Russian mm -hmm. doctor who, who did uh, basically, he supposedly did all, did all of Lance Armstrong stuff. And that guy ran Lance Armstrong's protocol to, and, and it did improve. He did improve. He was trying to become a pro cyclist. He, he didn't quite make, if I remember right, he didn't quite make it, but uh, um, it was really low doses what they ran. I think it was just some TRT and and just yeah, growth hormone. Doesn't take they, a lot for performance. Uh, they were using oh god, what is the EPO? EPO, yep, yeah. yeah, that promotes uh, yeah red blood cells. I mean, there are some bodybuilders that have messed around with that. It seems risky to me. I'd rather use EQ. I don't know why you would use it as a bodybuilder. There's no there's or, no. Uh, what's the other one that people use? Um, Draw blank begins of the C. I mean, anadrol's going <laughs> No, no, there's something like, um, like a peptide that people use. So I'm oh, oh, yeah, I can't uh, remember. The not carnitin, um, whatever that people use that does the same kind of thing. Supposedly it's safer. There's not a lot of human data in it, though. Uh, Dave and Jackie are, are donating $10 for the uh, the Saris, a vial of Saristem. I'm like, guys, you need to up, up the donation. That's not going to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> One vial of Saristem. Um, <laughs> I might get you a man. quarter of a vial. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, let's see here. I know some. <laughs> I was having a conversation with someone the other day, Paul. You know them. I'm not going to. say <laughs> They met someone who's selling. They have HIV or something. They've had it for a long time, and they've been sitting on their serostim since 2004. And they wanted to clear out their stock of it. Holy and they were wondering God. what they could get for serostim from 2004. Nothing. Um, nothing. It's not worth anything. <laughs> and the guy wanted a thousand bucks a box. It's crazy. Expired. Yeah, it's expired. It's 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 just it's if you live right near now. a city, I'll give you a tip. If you live near a big city, if you hang out near near an AIDS clinic, you can find Sarah's pretty easy. <laughs> just bring three hundred bucks with you. <laughs> All right. Next question. Uh, should you take your hembine fasted? Yeah, I mean I probably. Do. It upsets my stomach though. Sometimes. Yeah, I don't. I'm not a yohim bean. Doesn't make me feel very good. It makes my blood pressure do weird stuff too. I I actually I think the dosing I, is always weird too. It's not. I was having. I don't know if it was the yohim bean or the clambuterol, but I had like these massive dizzy spells the other week, and I checked my I checked my blood pressure, and it's like ninety over fifty. Yeah, it's probably the yohim bean. I I also think I'm not sure how standardized this stuff is when they make it. Right? I mean, it might say four, yeah. like five milligrams. Who knows what that is. I, I, had this never my, on it. I had this happen on my last contest prep where my blood pressure got super low at the end. I had to drop the Thomas Arden weeks ago. Yeah. Yohimbine, so people know, is really just blocking the alpha receptor so fat can't really get stored. So it's not really burning any fat. It just, I don't know. I think this, I think using growth hormone is a better way to do that. Probably. More expensive though than Yohimbine. Uh, let's see here. What do we got here? Uh, da, 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 da. what is this uh after workout sometimes i break out in cold sweats and suddenly feel very weak um any thoughts on it? yeah that's called going hypoglycemic yeah, <laughs> uh 
Um, yeah, your blood sugar. Yeah, eat, lay, drink, lay, lay down, and it happened the other day, and I lost all memories for three hours. Yeah, you went hypo. Yeah, it could be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, you can. You might not wake up. <laughs> I'm guessing he's either going fasted well, or he's working out. Shay, I talked to her. It's she. Okay, she. Yeah, I mean, yeah. definitely, I would eat. Yeah, so. you're hypo. That's 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 tra traditional. Cold sweats, feeling weak, shaky. You get hungry. Those are those are all symptoms of going hypoglycemic. Yeah. I, if you're not doing an intro workout shake, you probably could should. And I would say get some carbohydrates in as soon as you're you're, you're done with your workout. That's definitely you went hypo. Yeah, and probably um, something like cyclic dextrin too, so you don't get this big. Right, if you take dextrose, you're going to get this huge spike, and then it's going to drop again really fast. All right, so, uh, uh, Samson, it looks like my gym actually. Uh, maybe it is. It looks like the posing room in my gym. Uh, I'm going on a three-week family vacation off-season to Southeast Asia. What's the best approach to not fuck up my progress, but still enjoying the time with my family? Uh, the, so my, my, I don't know what you do on vacation, Kurt. I, if I'm taking a vacation, I don't I'm worry about. I'm on vacation. I don't worry about counting and measuring my food. But I do. That's what I tell people. Don't eat like an asshole. Yeah. Just pay it, just be moderate with it. I'll just I'll, what I'll do is just look at the menu and I'm like, well, that looks like the worst possible option that I could possibly get. So I, I if you want to be safe, a lot of times if it looks like it's a higher fat meal, I would stay away from the carbs. Yeah. That's I just yeah. do that. You're inversely correlated. And, and inversely, right? Just yeah. be careful mixing high fats and high carbs. It's really that simple. And have a have a, treat your I mean, how often do you get to go to Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. And realistically, what's going to happen in a week? Nothing. Just enjoy yourself. Enjoy ha have have some free meals and, you know, a couple a week, you know, I, just eat whatever. Yeah. You're in a lot of times what I found that actually when people come back from vacation, Better, right, stronger, meat, leaner. yeah, I'm usually leaner and I lose weight because I not end up not eating as much and I'm walking a lot yeah, and you're sweating. It's usually hot, right? Unless you're going to Aspen or something. Yeah, I'm on my feet. So just enjoy yourself. You're, you're not going to blow away no. your whole years of progress for, and for like, going on a vacation. I don't know about you, Paul, but like I go on vacation with my wife and my kids, and I think my diet probably aggravates them enough as it is. The last thing I want to do on vacation is yeah. make them eat, follow me. Like they eat enough chicken and rice because I eat a lot of chicken and rice. I don't want to make them do that. Yeah, I feel like a dick if I'm eating like a bodybuilder yeah. on vacation around my family and stuff. Um, yeah, you're right. It is. It is like a, you know, I I feel it's bad selfish. for my yeah, bodybuilding is a selfish sport. I I feel guilty like with my girlfriend like during contest prep like she'll want to go out to eat and I, I'm like can't. I can't. <laughs> I've gone out and just sat there, brought my own food, but again, that's in that's locally in a restaurant. I'm not on vacation. I haven't been that anal. There's been a couple times I've went out off schedule, but what I'll do is just eat a piece of meat. Yeah. That's it all today. It's not going to hurt you. I'll just I'll just whatever looks like the leanest piece of meat on the menu i'll just eat that yeah. i went the first show that i placed in the night before the show i went out and i had salmon and potatoes and broccoli i just asked them not to put oil on it you know and i it made no effect of anything i was leaner the next day i think people really overvalue some of this stuff um this, this is a well this is a truck question but it's a it's a good one c bomb recently said he's never used insulin how's that possible i mean it's i wouldn't surprise me not everyone uses insulin i i coach a couple ifbb pros and two of them don't use insulin never have actually one of them's never used growth hormone he's a big dude have you have you seen bumstead's diet he doesn't eat much no no it's i and like what Paul was saying earlier about the carbs. I consume at a minimum a thousand grams of carbs a day, and I'm not an insulin user. So it it just depends on the person, right? If I if I consumed a thousand grams of carbs and didn't use insulin, my glucose would be two hundred. <laughs> yeah, I go hypo real easy. Like the growth hormone actually keeps me not from from not going hypo. I mean Arnold, none of those guys. I mean none yeah. of the guys before no, the nineties used, used insulin. It's I think it's misunderstood. Like guys like you know you know I don't know. Can we talk about Roman or is that not appropriate? Yeah, Roman, Roman's very open about everything. So I think guys like Roman, Fritz, you know, who are open about their insulin usage, part of it isn't for the anabolism. It's because his pancreas literally can't support his food demand, right? He needs to eat that much food in order to maintain his weight. Without insulin, his body can't handle the food, right? It's not like insulin was required. Right. It just, it's required with his food quantity. 
yeah, I mean, you're you're you get to a point where you probably your pancreas just can't yeah. keep up. Now, if Chris Bumstead wanted to go to open and he was in perfect health, I believe he's got some issues. Um, I, yeah, I think he has uh, autoimmune disease or something. Yeah, I mean, like I would guess he'd have to use insulin to go to open, but I I, I remember him saying, I think it was they said that he had to cut down to like fifteen or sixteen hundred calories a day last year to make weight. Did you? Well, his he did a video a full day of eating during prep, and I think he was on twelve or thirteen hundred. It was Holy disgusting. Shit, it man. was like it was like what you have a bikini girl eat. That's crazy. He's just a big dude. Yeah. I, well, again, genetics. The guys in the Olympic stage have generally have the best genetics, right? They're gonna respond. I mean, to if he ate minimal stuff, like a normal bodybuilder, you'd probably be two eighty, two ninety. Yep. So yeah, I, I, I can firmly believe that. I mean, you look at his diet; he's not really eating a lot of carbs. I no, and he doesn't use a ton of gear, at least now, right? At least to yeah. hold size to get there. Who knows what he did to get yeah, there? Yeah, that, that's that's a whole other story. Those guys always like to say, "Well, I only use 500 grams of tests." I'm, I'm doing it. Like, I'm doing a video tomorrow on pro bodybuilder stickers, but got them there more yeah. than what they claim they use now. Because it's I argue with Todd about that when he was talking about his current cutting cycle. And he was talking about 280 milligrams of tests. And I was like, that's not what you got to do there, though. You know, it's no. grams of gear. Yeah, it doesn't take much to hold. No. Let me shut this thing off. Sorry. It's the same thing with food, though, too. Food is the same. Uh, training is the same. You don't have to do a whole lot to maintain. Uh, it's like, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't train that hard right now. No. You know, I don't, you know, in the off season I will. But on contest prep, I'm just trying to hold. It doesn't take – you don't have to go balls to the wall to hold hold your size with anything, with the food, with the gear, any of the stuff. So I, I, you know, like you said, he probably pushed things when he was putting the size yeah. on. But and and you, I don't know. I My nervous system is not what it once was no. as I approach 50. So I, I can't really push that hard in the gym like I used to. You know, like you're saying, I don't know if it's really required. I'm still making progress. Um, let me see here. Scott's got a question. Is it important to have a whole phase after balking or you can get, run straight into a cut, especially when PEDs are going, uh, are you really going to lose muscle? I like to have a hold phase. I, I, I feel like your body wants to have some sort of state of homeo, homeostasis. And if your weight's bouncing around all the time, I usually, what I find with my off season is I'll push up to a weight and I just kind of hang out there the whole off season. And then my body composition will just yeah. start getting a little bit better. So there's like a little like rough science not to get too deep in it. So like set point theory. So your hypothalamus in your brain kind of recognizes where your body is. It, it's very mm -hmm. aware of how much fat you have and how much muscle you have at all times. If you were to gain drugs might change some of this, but if you were to blow up and gain 30 or 40 pounds and then immediately diet, you're probably going to end up right back where you were because your body hasn't gotten used to that weight. I found probably what you're saying too. I, like anytime I've tried to just, move my weight up really fast and then go right into a diet. I end up not much better off than I was. I usually am better growing slower, holding it for a little bit and then cutting. Yeah. I, that's kind of, that's what, that's my, my approach to it too. All right. I'm going to get a couple more questions in and then I got to wrap this up. Yep. Uh, Griffin, do you agree with the thought that guys in their twenties should get strong? Uh, I read Dante Trudell discussing this. So there are certain numbers of goals to try to reach. What rep range should you go for? I worked with Dante for years and um, Dante trained me for, I don't know, three, four years, something like that. But you, you got to remember with Dante, this is, you got to put this in the context. It's, he's not training people to be power lifters. Dante's theory was when I worked with him, I think people pick, pick and choose bits and pieces of it. It was to get very strong with a, in with perfect form. In a given rep range, you it's it's progressive overload, really, is what it is. In his whole theory, really, it's sort of foolproof if you think about it. If you're doing your form exactly the same, and your weights are progressing, and you're eating more food, and you've gained weight, and you haven't gotten fat, there's only one possible outcome, and that's that you you've put on muscle. So. That was sort of his, he removed all the variables from it. And I think uh, JP, um, um, Jordan Peters, um, sort of ha expanded on that. I do think when you're younger, I, that that's the time to train heavier, in a heavier rep range. I will say this, when I worked with Dante, I didn't really do any powerlifting movements. A lot of it was machines. Um, so it wasn't like training like a powerlifter. You definitely trained like a bodybuilder. 
Um, I ha actually have a free DCE training thing up on my website if you want to download it. It's you just put your email address in. You don't have to pay anything for it. But I have a little ebook on on, on how to, how to DC train if you're interested in it. But that was the the concept. Is you like let's say if I was working on a Smith press. I would progressively increase the weights. Like if I was doing, he would have a prescribed rep range. Like let's say if it was eight to 10 reps, if I did eight reps for two plates on the uh, Smith machine or on the hammer strength press this week, I would do nine reps the following week, then 10 reps. And then I would add five pounds to it. And you continually do that. You continually eat more food. You keep your form consistent. And the idea is there that there's only one possible outcome is that you've grown. Get bigger. Yeah. I right. think um, I th there's also some structural reasons, probably why it makes sense to have a base of strength. Like you could never grow 20 inch arms if you're weak, right? Cause your shoulder right. and stuff wouldn't hold the, enough weight to actually right. be able to curl that. And again, it doesn't mean like you need to be able to curl 300 pounds, but that's why you don't see guys with enormous arms and small bodies. It just, it goes at your body grows the unit. And if it doesn't have the strength to support it, it's not going to have be able to hold it. I would say that's probably more for the intermediate bodybuilder. That's that's the area you'll you'll see guys that are professionals. They actually light, lighten up the weight. Usually. Yeah, I I lift a lot lighter ever since I met Paul. I lighten my loads up. Yeah, a lot of guys that are advanced bodybuilders end up lightening up up the weight and getting more out of the weight just because of wear and tear on joints. Um, I've even heard Dante talk about it recently, and his variable is just push up the rep range. Yep. You know, if you were doing six to eight reps, go up to twelve to fifteen. Yeah. Do it. Do a rep range you're comfortable yeah. in. Well, even and Paul Carter, who's like probably like an opponent to a lot of that stuff, even though I think he was friends with Dante, he will even so progressive overload is defined as right going up in weight or going yep. up in reps. Adding sets is not progressive overload. That's not an anti volume thing. It just that's technically not progressive overload. But so what Dante's saying is that's still making progress if you're adding a rep, right? Because yep. I think Dante said back in the day is in original stuff, he said add five pounds to the bar or add another rep or two. Yep. You can't do one of those, then you're not making progress. Try three weeks in a row. If you can't, scrap it. Yeah, move, pick a different exercise. He wasn't saying you it. had to go up and wait every time. It was you're making no. progress is the key. Right. Now the the thing with that is you're going to have to train to absolute failure to really, yeah. to really, to really find that. And that's that's where where you go from that intermediate to advanced bodybuilder. That I think when you get to an advanced bodybuilder weights, the training to absolute failure becomes risky. Um, you know, it's a lot different trying to add another rep to 225 on the bench press than it is adding another rep or five more pounds when you're doing 405. Yeah. I mean, I'll fail on things that are, that I'm braced. Like I'll fail on a T-bar row. I'll fail on a leg extension, a half right. squat, things where you can't really hurt yourself. I'm not failing on a barbell squat. I'm not failing on a barbell bench press. Even with the spotter, I don't see any point. They're just injury waiting to happen. Yeah, and I do think there's some things where guys get too obsessed with beating the law book, like like on cable curls and, and yeah, shit like yeah. that. I mean, I, I laugh. I see these young kids in the gym curling. I've got 20-inch arms, and I see dudes, or 21-inch arms, whatever they are. I see dudes with 13-inch spaghetti curling arms the 60s. curling the 60s. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm over here using the 35. Yeah, but actually squeezing the rep. Right. Yeah, and I think there's also like a – there's a wave. Like it, you probably experienced the same thing. I got stronger – probably up until my early forties. And then my strength kind of flattened out. Like I'm not getting any stronger now, but I'm still growing. So it doesn't, right. You know, you know, and I do think, I do think you can, you know, you talk, I mean, I guess it's technically not progressive overload, but I do think you can progress volume. That's what I do right yeah, now. No, so. You could progress volume. I was just saying it's, that's yeah. not considered overload per se. I know why. I don't know that. You there, not ask. There's that's all good. sorts of variables you can use for progression. You can, you can, I actually went back and cleaned up. I got my weights heavy and I went back and cleaned up and tightened my form up on everything. It's amazing how heavy it is when you do that. And then lighten my weight up by like 30% and then start progressing my weights again. Yep. Frank uh, Zane I, talked about that stuff in the seventies, right? He was never a big guy. Right. And he talked about making it more difficult instead of just trying to move more weight. I, I do think to grow, you do need some form of progression. And when you're a young yep. lifter, I do think it's important to establish a base of strength. And and progress the weights up, and as you become an advanced bodybuilder, then you have to you have to think a little yeah. more critically about things. And I think the the only other thing I would say about that that I've experienced personally is because I lifted heavy in bigger lifts for years and years since I was a little kid. I tore my quad a couple months ago on a hack squat. It tore at the bottom, and I got stuck. But it tore in the middle of the quad, 
and I, I saw three orthopedic surgeons and they said they'd never seen tendons in a knee that strong. And that's from years of heavy lifting, even though I don't lift like that anymore. So it develops that building strength develops those things. You're not going to get injured the same way. Right. They said a normal person, the knee would have come completely apart. Yep. Uh, let's see what Shay said. She said, thanks. Hypoglycemia is what I thought too. I did carbs pre-workout. I had 25. Yeah. 25 grams is enough. Isn't anything. Um, I probably need to increase the carbs and eat. Yes. And I would get some carbs and immediately post-workout. It's just your body's just soaking it all up. You're probably burning it all up. Yeah. And the leaner, she looks pretty lean. The leaner you are, the faster yeah. you metabolize things. Yeah. I talked to Shay. She went through a huge weight loss. She's leaner now. So you're more insulin sensitive now. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Do we want to grab one more before we more. go? Uh, let's see if there's anything here. Oh, somebody was asking, let's see, ask if we do our meal prep on Sundays. I, I do my meal prep on Sundays, actually. I don't, I, I'm fortunate that I can be home most of the time. I, um, I cook most of my meals fresh as I'm going to eat them. Oh, damn. Um, but that's because I can do most of my stuff. I can do most of my stuff. I mean, I'm home all day and I don't do that. <laughs> um, I enjoy cooking. I cook for my family too. So I'm constantly cooking. I, it's not to say that I won't, if I'm going to open a big package of meat, I might cook a couple meals, but I, I've always just enjoyed just making that decision too. Sometimes I don't want to eat the same thing four meals in a row. I eat the same thing every day, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody commented I'm, I'm, today. I really do eat the same thing pretty much too. I just try to pretend that it's different. I, I posted my progress pics and somebody said that bland chicken's paying off. <laughs> there's there's I no you need more margarine. <laughs> there's no uh secret to the bland chicken. It's just called I'm lazy. <laughs> and I get acid reflux if I yeah, eat anything that's your stomach up, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's another thing. I just, a point I want to hammer home about um, food before we go is pay close attention to your digestion. If I, I get people all the time, they tell me like I'm gassy or I'm bloated or I'm getting acid reflux. If that's happening, man, you need, you need to take a look at what you're eating and see what's causing it. I had a client recently um, Nick, if he's listening, but he was telling me he was uh had really bad gas and bloating and he couldn't figure out what was going on. He's like, I haven't changed anything in my diet. And what it was, his girlfriend was cooking all of his vegetables for him and she has been dousing it in garlic. There you go. And it was the garlic causing the problem. Yeah. Some, I'm not sensitive to it, but a lot of people are. I, yeah. Garlic fucks me up, man. Some people it does. Some people, some people don't, it, it is a high five map yep. food. So pay attention to the five map list. Um, all right, guys, I think that's all we got for you tonight. I'm, I'm actually shocked that we had this many people show up for a live stream on a middle of the week night late. Yeah, it's awesome. Appreciate you guys watching. Take care. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for watching guys.